Hi everybody, Jacob Reed here from ReviewEcon.com. Today we're going to be talking about GDP multipliers and marginal propensities. If after watching this video you still need a little more help, head over to ReviewEcon.com and pick up the Total Review booklet. It has everything you need to know to ace your microeconomics or macroeconomics exam. Let's get into the content. So before we get into the marginal propensities and multipliers for GDP, we first need to cover some basic definitions. The first definition we need to talk about is disposable income. Disposable income is the money that consumers have available to spend on goods and services. The formula for disposable income is your personal income minus taxes. And once you have your disposable income, we assume that there are only two things you can do with that income, spend it, or save it. And since spending or saving is all consumers can do with their disposable income, consumer spending and consumer savings added together will equal household disposable income. So let's take a look at an example. Let's say that a consumer has $100,000 worth of income and the government charges them $20,000 worth of taxes. Plug in the numbers and do the math and we find out this consumer has $80,000 of disposable income. If they save $8,000 of that disposable income, then they will be spending $72,000 of that disposable income. And if consumer disposable income increases, the savings and spending are both going to increase. On your exam, you may see disposable income only described as income. The next thing you need to know to cover the basics is average propensities. A propensity is a tendency to do something. And in this case, we're going to look at the average propensity to save or tendency for consumers to save and the average propensity or tendency for consumers to spend. The average propensity to save is the portion of disposable income that is saved rather than spent. The formula is the amount of savings divided by disposable income, and that's a decimal the average propensity or tendency to consume, on the other hand, or the APC, is the portion of disposable income that is spent rather than saved. The formula for the average propensity to consume is the total amount of spending divided by disposable income. So getting back to our example, that consumer who has $80,000 worth of disposable income, they saved $8,000 and spent $72,000. That means their average propensity to save is 0.1. It's the $8,000 in savings divided by the total amount of income of $80,000. And that means that the average propensity to consume is the amount of money spent on consumption. It's the $72,000 divided by the total amount of income of $80,000. And that gives us an average propensity to consume of 0.9. It's 90% of income spent expressed as a decimal. And since consumers will always spend and save 100% of their income, the average propensity to save plus the average propensity to consume will equal one. Now, if you took microeconomics already, you already know that marginal and average are both important and likely to show up on the exams, but marginal is where decisions are made. And when it comes to this topic for macroeconomics, marginal is where it's at. So make sure you focus on this next part. Here we are talking about marginal propensities, not average, but marginal. And we have the marginal propensity to consume, which is the percentage of new income that is spent rather than save. The formula for the marginal propensity to consume is the change in spending divided by the change in income for consumers. So if my income increases from $80,000 up to $100,000, that's a change in income of $20,000. If my spending increases from $72,000 up to $87,000, that's an increase of $15,000 worth of spending. So my marginal propensity to consume would be $15,000 change in spending divided by the $20,000 change in income. That's a 0.75 marginal propensity to consume. And that is a percentage of 75% expressed as a decimal because 75% of my increase in income was spent. The marginal propensity to save, on the other hand, is the percentage of new income that is saved rather than spent. The formula for the marginal propensity to save is the change in savings divided by the change in income. We already know that my income increased from 80,000 to 100,000, which is a change of $20,000. My savings is going to increase from $8,000 up to $13,000. That's a change of $5,000. So we're going to take that increase in savings of $5,000 divided by the $20,000 increase in income, and that gives me a marginal propensity to save of 0.25. That's 25% of my new income has been saved. And once again, it's a percentage expressed as a decimal. Let's look at one more example to make sure we fully understand it. Let's say income increases by $1,000, and that increase in income leads to an increase in spending of $800 and an increase in savings of $200. When you plug in the numbers and do the math, you find a marginal propensity to consume of 0.8 
and a marginal propensity to save of 0.2. And just like with the average propensities, the marginal propensity to save plus the marginal propensity to consume will equal one. Now we're going to move on to how the marginal propensity to save and marginal propensity to consume can impact an overall economy with this thing called the spending multiplier. To figure out how this looks, we're going to look at the country of Islandia. In the country of Islandia, every consumer on this island has a marginal propensity to consume of 0.8. That means they spend 80% of changes in income. Of course, that means everybody in this island nation has a marginal propensity to save of 0.2, meaning they save 20% of new income. And when there's new spending in Highlandia, that spending is going to multiply through the economy and have a much larger impact on gross domestic product or national income. We're going to start off this example by talking about Victor. Victor just earned $1,000 and he's going to spend 80% of that money on a new canoe. This is $800 worth of new autonomous consumption. And Victor bought that new canoe from Thomas, who makes canoes for a living. Thomas now has that $800 and he is going to spend 80% of it, which is $640 on a new bicycle. And Thomas bought that new bicycle from Angela. Angela produces bicycles in Islandia. And Angela now has $640. She's going to spend 80% of it, which is $512 on a brand new laptop. She of course saves the rest. Angela bought the laptop at Gary's computer shop. Gary now has $512. He's going to spend 80% of it, which is $409.60, and save the rest. And Gary bought a new television. And that new television was purchased at Victoria's electronics shop. Victoria now has $409.60 to spend. She's going to save 20% of it and spend the rest. That, of course, is $327.68 that she uses to purchase rock climbing equipment. So with Victor's original increase in consumption of $800, we see a multiplying effect on the overall economy. That original $800 in spending has become much more spending. Of course, the $327.68 will continue to be spent at a rate of 80% and saved at a rate of 20%. And that will keep on going until the original $1,000 that Victor earned is entirely saved by different people within the Islandia economy. And so the moral of this story is that a small change in a component of GDP will cause a much larger change in national income, or GDP. That original $800 increase in consumption by Victor can become a $4,000 increase in real GDP. It's actually a rightward shift of aggregate demand in the ASAD model. In order to find out how much new spending can impact the overall economy, we have a formula. That formula is one divided by the marginal propensity to save. In Islandia, that was one divided by 0.2, which equals five. You could also find it by taking one divided by one minus the marginal propensity to consume. And then we take the original increase in spending of $800, multiply it by the spending multiplier of five, and that gives us a $4,000 maximum increase in Islandia's GDP. And so the formula for figuring out the maximum change that we can see within the economy is to take the original or initial change in any type of spending within the economy times the multiplier, and that is the maximum change we could see in total GDP. This applies to any new consumer spending, new gross investment or business spending, new government purchases, and changes in net exports, which is exports minus imports. And again, these are maximum changes because in reality, with changes in income, there could be some leakages, like increases in taxes or increases in imports. And because of the way the formula is calculated, increases in the marginal propensity to consume will also increase the spending multiplier as a whole. And likewise, increases in the marginal propensity to save will actually decrease the spending multiplier as a result of that increase. So we just saw how an increase in consumer spending could increase GDP. If instead of consumer spending, we had an increase in gross investment when the marginal propensity to consume was 0.75, we can see how much a $10,000 increase in gross investment could impact the overall economy. Calculating the multiplier, we have one divided by one minus the MPC, which is four, and that tells us the $10,000 purchase of new capital equipment can increase overall national income by $40,000. And of course, that's a maximum change. If on the other hand, we had a change in government spending when the marginal propensity to save is 0.1, this time instead of an increase in spending, let's say there's a $5 million decrease in government spending. The multiplier is going to work the same way even with a decrease in spending. Let's calculate the multiplier. It's one divided by 
0.1, that's the MPS, and that equals a spending multiplier of 10. Times that by the $5 million decrease in government spending, and that gives us a maximum $50 million decrease in overall national income. For our last example, we're going to look at net export changes. Let's say the country has a marginal propensity to consume of 0.95 and there's a $1 million decrease of net exports. The spending multiplier will be one divided by one minus the MPC, which is 20. And that means the $1 million decrease in net exports could decrease gross domestic product by a maximum of $20 million. Next, we're going to talk about the tax multiplier. And here we're looking at the increase or decrease in government taxes that can impact the overall economy. Remember, taxes are going to change the amount of disposable income that consumers have available to spend or save. The formula for the tax multiplier is the negative MPC divided by the MPS. Or it can also be found by finding the negative MPC divided by one minus the MPC. The tax multiplier is always going to have a absolute value that is one less than the spending multiplier. And the reason why the tax multiplier is one less absolute value than the spending multiplier is because when taxes are reduced, some of that reduction in taxes is going to be saved rather than spent by consumers. So let's say, for example, we have a marginal propensity to consume of 0.8 and a marginal propensity to save of 0.2. That gives us a tax multiplier of negative 0.8 divided by 0.2, which is negative 4. So if the government decreases taxes by $10 million, that'll be negative 10 million times negative four gives us a maximum increase of GDP of $40 million. Now there haven't been any questions about it on the AP macroeconomics exam that I've seen yet, but when it comes to transfer payments, you are going to see a increase in transfer payments as a reduction in taxes. Transfer payments are things like unemployment compensation, social security payments, or food stamp programs. Next, we're going to talk about the balanced budget multiplier. When it comes to the balanced budget multiplier, we're talking about equal changes in taxes and spending. So increasing spending by the same amount as increases in taxes. That's going to keep the government's budget balanced or not change the deficit or surplus. So in other words, the government will not have to change the amount of money that they're borrowing. And the formula for the balanced budget multiplier is pretty simple. It's one just one. And that means that if government spending and government taxes increase by the same amount, GDP will increase by that amount at most. So here's an example to illustrate it. Let's say that we have a marginal propensity to consume of 0.9 and a marginal propensity to save of 0.1. If government spending increases by $10 million and taxes increase by $10 million, let's see what the net effect will be. With a marginal propensity to save of 0.1, we have a 10 multiplier so that government spending increase will increase GDP by a maximum of $100 million. But the tax multiplier is going to be negative nine, and that means the increase in taxes will have a negative $90 million impact on GDP at most. And that gives us a net effect of a positive or increase of $10 million on GDP. And so if you take the balanced budget multiplier of one and multiply it by the $10 million increase of both taxes and government spending, that gives us a maximum impact of a $10 million increase in GDP. If on the other hand, we have an MPC of 0.8 and an MPS of 0.2, while there was a decrease in government spending of $20 million and a decrease in taxes of $20 million, the decrease in government spending will have a maximum change of negative $100 million impact on GDP, and the decrease in taxes will have a maximum impact of $80 million in GDP. The net effect is a $20 million decrease in GDP. At most. So if we take the balanced budget multiplier of one and multiply it by the negative $20 million change in government spending and taxes, that gives us a maximum net effect of a $20 million decrease in GDP. Finally, we're going to talk about some advanced examples here. And the first important one we're going to look at is working backwards. If we have a country that has a 0.9 MPC and a 0.1 MPS, while the current real GDP output for the economy is $150 million, at the same time, the potential real GDP output is $200 million. That means we have an output gap of negative $50 million. This economy is currently suffering from a recession. And if they produce an additional $50 million, they will be at the full employment level of output. To find out how much new government spending could close that recessionary gap, you take the amount of the gap, $50 million, divide it by our spending multiplier of 10, and that gives us a $5 million increase in government spending that could close that output gap. 
You could also see questions that have combinations of actions that occur. Let's say we have an MPC of 0.9 and an MPS of 0.1. If there was a $4 billion decrease in net exports, while we also had a $5 billion decrease in taxes, the impact of the change in net exports will be the negative $4 billion times a spending multiplier of 10, which gives us a $40 billion decrease in GDP. And that tax decrease will be multiplied by a negative 9 tax multiplier, giving us a $45 billion increase in real GDP from the taxes. So if we take the $45 billion increase in GDP and subtract the $40 billion decrease in GDP, that gives us a net impact of a $5 billion increase in GDP as a result of the net effect of these two changes. And there you have it. That's what you need to know about marginal propensities and spending and tax multipliers. There's a lot of math involved and you're definitely going to want to practice this before your next test. If you're ready for that, head over to ReviewEcon.com and play the propensities and multipliers game. If you still need more help after that, pick up the Total Review booklet. It has everything you need to know to ace your microeconomics or macroeconomics exam. That's it for now. I'll see you all next time.